John Garcia, hopefully you're having a great afternoon. Welcome into the game in T-Town. Yeah, Ryan. I'm actually uh, getting closer to your area code, headed to Birmingham uh, to check out some spring football practice. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful time of year. We get uh, the best of, of all the worlds colliding. Yeah, John, it seems like Alabama's picking up some momentum. We talk about the world of recruiting. Give us the latest. Well, yeah, um, you hit it right on the head, and, and, I, and it relates to, to kind of what we're doing. You know, it's a lot of momentum, and a lot of that momentum is, is in state and, and in the 205, you know, in the Birmingham area. Um, obviously, most recent commitment, Amari Kite out of Thompson High School. So now Alabama has the commitments from the blind side, left tackle protectors for both quarterback commitments, Paul Tyson and Talia Tengo both of their left tackles now also committed to Alabama. So um, it's, it's rolling pretty good right now. Um, ten commitments, five of them in state. And again, last year or in the 2018 cycle, Alabama signed just two from the state of Alabama. So we've long kind of talked about how it was going to be a much heavier year in state, a busier year in state and um it, we're, we're seeing that come to fruition but um you know like we say when talking about alabama and in general it's it, it's not quite over just yet so do great left tackles make great quarterbacks or do great quarterbacks make great left tackles i think they, they can go hand in hand <laughs> for sure um and it's, it's obviously a unique relationship there's, there's a lot of trust there on both sides most people look at the quarterback trusting that that offensive lineman but you know, the quarterback's got to bail out that that offensive lineman at some point, you know, so there's got to be some trust both ways. If, you know, he, he's got his back to the quarterback, so if, if the defensive end, you know, picks one way and, and the O-lineman decides to, to drive him the way that he chooses, the quarterback's got to kind of feel that and, and bail out that left tackle and keep the sack off of uh, off of the board there. So it's a unique relationship, um, but they can make each other better, that's for sure. I mean, some of the Left tackles that are Hall of Famers. Um, a lot of them have are famous for not giving up sacks. Well, a lot of those quarterbacks they played with helped them out by getting the ball out quickly, being mobile, things like that. So uh, it's a unique, very, very trustworthy type of relationship. And obviously Alabama is going to be bringing in uh, two batteries like that in the same class. Uh, definitely something I haven't seen in covering recruiting. John, when you look at the NFL draft – when you do you write down little personal notes and I know you write archives and articles that are archived and you can go back but you look at the NFL draft many of the guys that was drafted uh, this past weekend from the University of Alabama you had a chance to cover as high schoolers sophomores juniors seniors in high school do you look at di- different guys and you kind of make notes mental notes little sticky notes and think hey this guy's going to be a first round this guy's going to be in the NFL draft this is a guy that we're going to be talking about three or four years from now yeah, you know, that's the goal, right? The, um, you know, the, the standard uh, for good, bad, or different, the standard for recruiting rankings has now become the NFL draft. Um, so that first round is, is particularly, you know, you know, pecked through and, and dug into because of, of the star system and do stars matter and all that fun stuff. And all the analytics say, of course, that they do, but, you know, you want to be as right as possible regardless of where these guys end up. But, you know, from, from this past class, you know, I remember the, the end of Rashawn Evans' you know, high school career, you know, when we were just deciding, do we keep him as a high four-star? Do we give him the fifth star? I mean, everything he showed us at the end there was what he showed at the end of his Alabama career, which is what propelled him into the first round. That, that true versatility, great athleticism, the ability to do kind of a little bit of everything, cover a guy, rush the passer, play a traditional inside linebacker spot. You know, all those things combined uh, with, with good um, intellect, height, weight, speed, and all that as well, um, it kind of pushed him over the top for us. And um, it, it, it did the same, you know, with the NFL. So something like that is cool. There are a lot of parallels like that that we see. but And some are just kind of easy, to be honest, Ryan. We, we don't have to work too hard on some guys. You know, the, the Deron Payne evaluation was not exactly something we spent you know, every waking moment thinking about. I mean, the kid started as the number one player in the state, got his fifth star soon after, and, and really never let let up, you know, in our opinion. So sometimes it's pretty easy, but but it's, it's always cool to see those parallels for those guys like a Rashawn Evans uh, who kind of blossomed late uh, in terms of, you know, as a, ranked, as a recruit 
and, and they get the same thing at the collegiate level. So we, we definitely look back as much as we can, and the draft always is a reminder of that. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a fun time of year to look back at where we were right with those guys and where we were wrong. You know, Tony Br- if you'd have told me Tony Brown goes undrafted, you know, I, even with whatever happens off the field, if you'd have told me that at any point in the last four years, I would have probably laughed. But that's uh, that's the draft, and that's that's the game, right? That's that's the whole thing. Uh, so it goes both ways, but it's certainly um, a point to look back uh, every year around this time. What went wrong for Tony, in your opinion? Was it was it the the mental distraction? Because he has the skill set to be one of those first round guys, but just never could sort of get it together everywhere on every everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, yeah, physically, I mean, you're talking six foot, 200 pounds, 4'3", laser 40, your track speed, physical guy. I mean, what more could you want, right, on the hoof? But, um, and it started off so well for him. People forget. I mean, Marlon Humphrey's getting redshirted. They came in together. Humphrey's redshirted, and, and part of that decision was because at the time, Tony was, was the guy who was more ready to play right now, and, and he played a lot as a true freshman. I believe he started some games at cornerback. Um, so... Really, from the beginning, it was clear the type of talent Tony had, even at, at Alabama's level. But like you said, you know, uh, it seemed like there was such a lack of consistency with him, both on and off the field after that point. Maybe it was confidence. Maybe it was a personal thing. We've, we've all heard stories of, of he and Nick Saban kind of going back and forth at different points. Um, so all of that can factor in, you know, as well as other guys kind of waking up, right? Obviously, single game until he was a first round draft pick so you know there's only so much opportunity for guys and, and you know uh, you give credit to tony for sticking it out because in this era a lot of guys wouldn't and we, we see guys transferring every year with, with similar circumstances so you give him some credit there but but clearly there was some non-physical or you know consistency issues there with tony and it took him a long time to, to get back into the true good graces but you know luckily for him um he's the uberly talented physically i would again i'd be surprised if he didn't make an nfl roster um i think he could do a lot of things for you and at a minimum he plays every special teams and he's your gunner on punt team and all that fun stuff so uh, there's a place for guys like that there's guys who played 12 15 years who just kind of aced that part of the game so at a minimum i think tony could at least you know try to get to that point John Garcia, National Recruiting Analyst for 247 Sports. Let me go back to the 2018 class. Uh, If you were there in Vegas and you're walking up to the counter and you were going to put your money down on one player that you think will be a, you know, an NFL-type player out of the 2018 class, including the four early enrollees, Stephen Wynn, Savion Smith, Slay Bolden, Skyward Along, and then we look at the other guys that will be arriving here shortly, is there one guy that you circle and you say, this guy could be, be that player that might be a high pick in the NFL draft that you like? Yeah, uh, well, I think the safest pick would, would be Savion Smith because, you know, we've seen him play big-time ball. We hear all these good things. He plays a premium position, you know, the, the five premium positions, right? Quarterback, left tackle, cornerback, edge rusher, uh, interior guy on defense. Those are the five. So he plays one of those. So those are always – good factors for a safer bet, but I'll roll the dice more. You know, if I'm in Vegas, right, let's go with the Yabi Anoma, the guy who, out of all of those 2018 signees, has played the least amount of football, but you talk about freaky, you talk about first step, and, and again, he's one of, he's playing one of those premium positions. He's a classic edge rusher. You know, somebody asked me recently, is, is he the best, you know, pure edge guy that, that Nick has ever signed at Alabama? And I think if you're looking at it from an athleticism and purely a pass rushing perspective, when you factor in where he is now, where he could be sealing all of that, I think that answer is yes. And, and obviously that is a lot to say, but I think that's the type of talent that Ayabi Anoma possesses uh, coming out of Washington, D.C., just two years of football under his belt. And he'll, um, he'll be arriving later this month, now, now that we're in May, and uh, he'll be ready to go. I, I think you find a way to let him see the field in some capacity, much like we saw with Tim Williams early in his Alabama career. The only difference is I think Ayabi's a little bit taller and a little bit more explosive, which is, you know, again, it's not a knock on Tim. That's that's where Ayabi is athletically. So take pick Savion Smith, but if we're in Vegas, give me uh, Ayabi and Oba. John, final couple of questions. We're discussing coaches today. We're talking about hot coaches 
you know, if Nick Saban decided to retire two or three years from now, who would you make the phone call to? And I just want to ask you from a recruiting perspective, if John Garcia, the athletic director at the University of Alabama, has got to replace Nick Saban in four years, who is John Garcia calling? Who is it out there that you like that could you put in this pressure cooker that is the University of Head Coach, University of Alabama head coaching job? You know, you, you you hate to go chalk, and I'm I'm a contrarian by nature, but after after Clemson beat Alabama in that national championship, it's got to be Dabo, right? From a recruiting perspective, from a, you know he's a legacy guy, played played at Bama, from Pelham, right outside of Birmingham. Uh, you know he's got kind of everything that that you looked for, everything you were looking for with. With Nick Saban, Dabo has has some of that, you know, going on uh, earlier in his in his life. So it, it's got to be him. You, you got to at least make the call now. Depending on when Nick is, is ready to hang him up, or depending on you know where Dabo is at that point, you know, who knows if, if he even considers the jump. You know, if he's got another title or two, he may just you know want to settle in and, at, at a great situation at Clemson. I don't know how successful it would be depending on when it goes down. But to me, right now, you, you've got to make that call uh, to Dabo first. Um, there's only, what, four four active head coaches who've won a national championship, right? So obviously one of them would be departing if we're talking about replacing Nick Saban. So you got to try to, to snag one of the other ones. Um, it's all about precedent. It's all about what you've already been able to accomplish and, and having the, the most resources to do it again with a little bit more pressure. I think Dabo's kind of the guy who fits it's all, all checks all those boxes, fits that mold um, for Alabama. But, but again, I mean, depending on how successful he is these next few years, I, I just I don't know uh, if it's a no brainer like maybe we thought a couple of years ago even. So um, it'll be a fun situation to, to look at when it actually happens. But um, there could be some obviously some more national champion coaches by that point. So it'll it'll probably widen the pool uh, a little bit. John, is Nick Saban is the biggest obstacle that he's having to fight is his age on the recruiting front? Yeah, you know, it still comes up. Not not as much as it used to, but it still comes up. Um, there's there's kind of like a de facto, you know, recruit against Bama template that, that teams use if they choose to bring up Alabama, which some just won't because why, why would you bring up the defending champs? Um, but if they do bring it up, age is, is kind of the – their first play they'll bring up the depth chart they'll bring up all these things but you know at every turn there's there's now evidence tangible evidence that you know that goes against all of those those templated responses from these coaches but it's still age because that's the one thing that that you really can't change so that's you know you can reverse perception with freshman playing you can reverse perception with i don't know resources scheduling big time opponents television games all the things that can can change with a program, but but the age of the head coach obviously is something that is kind of set in stone. So it's going to continue to be talked about some, but um, you know we've asked recruits about it recently these last few weeks at camps, and, and we're hearing it just a little bit less. Some of them have heard it a lot. Some of them haven't heard that negative recruiting at all. So it's balancing itself out just a little bit, but but that will remain kind of uh, play one for uh, Coach X looking to, to maybe come into Bama and get a kid or, or compete head-to-head with, with Nick for an out-of-state recruit. 